screen. And there we are. That's me. Three people in the waiting room. Matt and Elizabeth, can you hear us? It's 3.30. Yeah. You can go ahead and read. Yeah. I got it. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This meeting will be held with two of our council members participating electronically via Zoom. And the public is able to join, is also able to join this meeting via Zoom. In order to allow the town clerk enough, everything is... That better? You getting that now? Yes, sir. Okay. I didn't memorize this. Good afternoon. This meeting will be held with two of our council members participating electronically via Zoom, and the public is also able to join this meeting via Zoom. In order to allow the town clerk enough time to make sure that everything is working properly and folks are able to join the meeting, we will begin the meeting in about five minutes or so. Anyone who wishes to speak during public comment should type their name and address in the chat box and you will be called on and unmuted when it is your turn to speak. Public comments that were submitted to the town clerk prior to the meeting will be read by me first. As usual, public comments will be limited to no more than three minutes. Thank you for being patient with us as we adjust to hosting electronics meetings. Good afternoon. This meeting will be held with two of our council members participating electronically via Zoom, and the public is also able to join this meeting via Zoom. In order to allow the town clerk enough time to make sure that everything is working properly and folks are able to join the meeting, we will begin the meeting in about five minutes or so. Anyone who wishes to speak during public comments should type their name and address in the chat box, and you will be called on and unmuted when it's your turn to speak. Public comments that were submitted to the town clerk prior to the meeting will be read by me first. Um, As usual, public comments will be limited to no more, no more than three minutes. Thank you for being patient with us as we adjust to hosting electronic meetings. Text to the And to Jimmy. Is 
Elizabeth, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Matt, are you there? Good afternoon. This meeting will be held with two of our council members participating electronically via Zoom, and the public is also able to join this meeting via Zoom. In order to allow the town clerk enough time to make sure that everything is working properly and folks are able to join the meeting, we will begin the meeting in about five minutes or so. Anyone who wishes to speak during public comment should type their name and address in the chat box, and you'll be called on and unmuted when it's your turn to speak. Public comments that were submitted to the town clerk prior to the meeting will be read by me first. As usual, public comments will be limited to no more than three minutes. Thank you for being patient with us as we adjust the hosting electronic, as we adjust to hosting electronic meetings. Matt says he's watching. Matt needs to turn on his audio. He says it's on. Can you hear me, Elizabeth? Yes. Okay. All right. I was just waiting for somebody to talk to me. <laughs> Sheila, can you hear him? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we're all good. <laughs> Regular meeting of the Southern Shores Town Council for April the 7th, 2020 is now in session. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. United States of America, and to the Republic, for which, for which it stands, one nation, under, under God, 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 indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Last Sunday, I asked Pastor Chris Ablett of Duck United Methodist Church if he would consider sharing his thoughts with me. About the time we are going through and the time we're living in right now. I also asked him to include a prayer for our council in that message. To my friends and neighbors in Southern Shores, we're all concerned about COVID-19, and rightly so. What started off as something that was happening on the other side of the world has at last come to the Outer Banks. We watch the news and feel like our world is shrinking before our eyes. Seemingly, in the blink of an eye, our whole world has changed. The very foundations of our society feel unstable right now. Out of an abundance of caution, we have managed to stay home in order to stay safe. But many of us don't feel safe. We feel isolated, afraid, unsure about what each day will bring. But in the swirling mix of emotions that we are all feeling right now, I am reminded that our faith tells us that our God is up to the challenge. I encourage us to draw on our faith in this time. Since the beginning of our republic, 
Faith has been the bedrock of our nation's heritage. Buoyed by the hope that comes from that faith, let me offer this prayer. O oh God, our Father, we turn to you in our, in our hour of need and humbly ask for your help. Help us to provide the direction and decision-making that our community needs from us right now. Strengthen us for the task before us. Grant us the gift of wisdom, sound judgment, and compassionate leadership. Guide us in these challenging times and help us to serve your people well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I'm most grateful to Pastor, Pastor Chris for his message. I appreciate him and taking the time to do that for us. At this time, I'd make a motion to approve the agenda for today's meeting with the deletion of item four, budget workshop business in its entirety, items A through F. Do I have a second? Second. second it. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Is there yeah. any other parts of the agenda you want to not deal with today? Here. Is there any it come from the speakers? Is there any other parts of the agenda that you want to have amended today? No, that's the only thing I, I would like to see amended today. Any further any further questions or discussion? I'm going to call for a vote by roll by roll call method. So I'll ask you if you're. I'll start with with uh, Councilman Connors. Jim, are you okay with that? Yes. Leo? Yes. I'm also an I. Elizabeth? I. Matt? I. The ayes have it. Motion's made and carried to, to amend the agenda as I, as I just stated. This time I would ask for a motion. I'm sorry, I'll make a motion, if you will, to approve the consent agenda, item E, tab one in your book. I'll, sec I'll second the amendment. Thank you, Jim. Any further discussion? No. Nope. Hearing none, I'll, uh, I'll call for a vote to, to uh, accept the consent agenda as presented. Jim? Aye. Leo? Aye. Elizabeth? Aye. Matt? Aye. And I'm an aye. So the motion is made and carried to pass the consent agenda as presented. At this time, I'll call on the interim town manager, planning director for his report. Wes. Thank you and good afternoon, mayor, members of council, everyone able to join us. First, I'll start off with the town's response to COVID-19. Town offices have been and remain closed to the public. Services are still being provided via email, virtual meetings, phone, fax, our online permitting system, and our outdoor drop box. Solid waste and recycling are being collected on schedule, but the large item pickup that was scheduled for April 3rd has been postponed to a later date. We continue to update our website and Facebook page with COVID-19 related information. In addition, we're sharing urgent information and the county's emergency bulletins in the town's electronic newsletter. Information being provided by the School of Government and continued communication with the other jurisdictions in Dare County have been very helpful as we are all in this situation together. All town employees were reporting to work as normal and practicing social distancing guidelines and cleaning recommendations while working. We are currently all healthy, feeling well, and busy responding to the impacts of this pandemic while continuing to provide the town's usual services. With respect to budget planning, work on the proposed budget continues and all the department's requested expenditures have been added. Due to the anticipated loss of revenue as a result of the COVID-19 pandem pandemic, we're working on options that would help offset that loss. We'll present those options to you and seek guidance on projects to include or not include in the proposed budget at Council's April 21st budget work session. With respect to Capitol Street projects, work on the East Dogwood Trail Street Improvement Project continues. The, 
project completion date is still May 1st. Um, secondly, the bid opening for the Dewberry Lane Street Improvement Project uh, will be held this Thursday at 10 a.m., most likely here in the Pitt Center, and we'll most likely be able to set up Zoom for that as well. With respect to the South Dogwood Trail walking path, construction on the South Dogwood Trail walking path continues. And the project is about 70% complete. With respect to the town building's code deficiencies, local architect Mike Flores will soon be working on providing us plans and an estimate for updating the town-owned buildings. We hope to have an estimate soon that we can prepare and release an RFQ for the work entailed. With respect to beach nourishment, Three coastal engineering firms responded to the RFQ that the town of Duck released for future beach nourishment and related shoreline management efforts. The goal is to obtain a consultant to assist the towns of Duck, Kitty Hawk, Kill Devil Hills, and possibly Southern Shores in a coordinated effort. Virtual interviews with each of the three firms will take place this Thursday and each town will score each firm and subsequently meet to discuss selection. Also with respect to beach nourishment, this was with respect to funding. Last year, the legislature in session law 2019-224 allocated $11.5 million to NCDEQ's Division of Water Resources Coastal Storm Damage Mitigation Fund to be used to provide grants in an amount not to exceed $2.5 million for each uh, unit of local government during the 2019-2021 fiscal biennium. The deadline for submittal is April 30th of this year, and we could apply for one or more projects, which could be the maintenance work in the Pelican Watch area, and or one of the four options recommended in the town's beach management plan. We will seek council's guidance at the April 21st budget work session as to which, if any project, you prefer. Lastly, with respect to bay disposal uh, and our current recycling, we received notice from NCDEQ yesterday that they have authorized all of the local governments in Dare County to continue hauling collected recyclables to the Wheelbrader facility in Portsmouth with no given time frame. We also received notice last week from NCDEQ that in Murph and Portsmouth, owned by Recycling Disposal Solutions, RDS, out of Roanoke, Virginia, is now available. They have been trying to secure a location in Elizabeth City, but so far have been unsuccessful. We now have the option of entering into a contract with RDS that will currently cost around $95 per ton to have our recyclables, recyclables processed at their facility. In that cost does not include collection and hauling of our recyclables. That concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. If you or any of the council members have any questions, I can try to answer them. Thank you, Wes. My, my, my one question was, what's that total number if we have to pay for, continue to pay for the hauling? Or is there any way to- continue? I've had a discussion with Josh Smaltz with Bay Disposal about uh, the possibility of that. And um, he was not willing to give us a number at this time, how much it would cost if we were to, um, you know, request and enter into a contract for services for them to haul our recyclables to this other facility. So I do not know. All we know is that uh, based on the current um, market, uh, it looks like we'd be paying around $95 per ton just for this facility to take our materials. Does not include a vendor collecting and delivering those materials there uh, for us. So we don't have a total number right now. All we know is it will be $95 per ton for processing. All right, understood. Thank you. And that material would be recycled or used for energy? It is a MRF. Um, it, it would okay. be recycled, processed as recycled. I have one other thing. Uh, it's not a question, but I really wanted to thank um, all the staff and the mayor and everybody else who's having to deal with this coronavirus. I know you guys are slammed. Um, Dare County, the governor, everybody deserves a, a great big thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're all in this together for sure, and we're all trying to work together as best we can. Thank you, Wes. Yes, sir. Do you have anything you want to say? Is your, time, is your, your report time is up right now, if you want to. No, sir, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I don't have anything to report tonight. We'll get you later. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this time I'll open general public comment, and I have a few I'm going to read that were written in or sent in to us uh, earlier. Well, there would be a sheet that provided you, a sheet. 
the sheet. Public comment. Read that. Gotcha. Sorry. Thanks, Wes. Mm -hmm. Can I talk? Before I start to read oh. off the ones that I've received earlier, or we received earlier, I would like to say anyone who wishes to speak during public comments should type their name and address in the chat box, and you will be called on and unmuted when it's your turn to speak. Public comments that were submitted to the town clerk prior to the meeting are the ones I was talking about a minute ago that I will read first. As usual, public comments will be limited to no more than three minutes. If I'm reading your, uh, Sheila will be timing uh, me as I read your, your public comment. And she'll tell me when I've gone used up to three minutes. Thank you. This from Mr. Fred Newberry, 267 North Dogwood Trail. Sheila, following my comments, Following on my comments, I would like to be read during the public comment period of the Southern Shorestown Council meeting of April the 7th. Everyone throughout the globe is being severely impacted by the coronavirus. As a result, there is considerable amount of uncertainty about the future health of individuals and nations worldwide. In addition, researchers at Colorado State University are predicting a heavier than average hurricane season in the Atlantic this year. At the local government level, Southern Shores, along with surrounding municipalities, is having to make difficult decisions about the future health of its citizens, as well as the economic health of the town. I highly recommend that the council follow the Dare County manager's lead and develop a zero increase budget for fiscal year 2020-2021. Only essential services should be budgeted and the council should postpone acting on any expenditure for large projects, such as beach nourishment, street construction, or other similar projects. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the NC governor's state of emergency declaration and statements he made in last Friday's press conference, there is too much uncertainty about the economic health of North Carolina, the Outer Banks and Southern Shores. Our unassigned fund, fund, unassigned fund balance must be preserved for hurricane contingencies as well as impacts from the pandemic. Following are some of the assumptions that support my thoughts. The 2020 OBX tourist season has already been impacted and most likely rental houses will be nowhere near their seasonal capacity. Even when, this, when the state of emergency order is lifted, visitors will be reluctant to visit the Outer Banks as well as other destinations. Many people will probably lose their jobs and visitors will not be allowed to dispose, have the disposal income to, to vacation. The number of people who have applied for unemployment is staggering. Sales and occupancy tax revenue, excuse me, sales and occupancy tax revenue will be minimal due to lack of rental home income, restaurant and other business sales. Southern Shores depends on proceeds from these taxes as part of its annual revenue. Home sales will be minimal. Therefore, the town's revenue from transfer taxes will be minimal. New construction and remodeling may decline and revenue from permit charges will decrease as well. Real estate taxes may decline as well as there may be many homeowner bankruptcies. The town's tax base could potentially decrease. The stock market is extremely, is extremely volatile and has decreased significantly. As a result, 401k and other retirement programs have incurred extreme losses. There's also, there are also rumors of federal retirement and other annuities being reduced. Since Southern Shores residents are federal retirement, I'm sorry, primary, primarily retirees, they cannot afford any tax increases. Hurricane season is approaching and there's unassigned funds should be preserved for emergencies. Our economic and physical health are critical and we must preserve our resources. I appreciate your consideration of my comments and wish the council well in making good decisions today and into the future. Fred Newberry, thank you. My name is Robert Garber. I'm a property owner in Southern Shores. First, I'm shocked that the agenda for this meeting is nothing more than a business as usual. During an emergency, emergency declaration, I expected the agenda to be devoted to issues and actions for coronavirus responses and addressing obvious concerns of those citizens that the council represents. The barring of non-resident property owners from access to their property is wrong and unfair. I retired and moved to Southern Shores in mid-January. When I left on Tuesday, 3-17-20, for a short trip out of town, This action by Southern Shores and Dare County by the control group was not publicized and did not use the emergency email text bulletin system. 
moreover, I not even provide the, not, did not even provide the courtesy of a reasonable time to respond. I was shocked Saturday morning as I prepared to return that I was barred from entry. This action is causing me financial impact, worry, and un uncertainty. We planned a stay healthy in place strategy long before the town of the county announced any actions. I prepared my Southern Shores home with supplies and groceries as we intended to sequester there for the duration of the coronavirus, coronavirus outbreak. But they are now lost or unavailable to me. I'm not at my property to, to maintain it or repair it if needed. There was a recent nor northeaster that may have caused damage. The Dare County measure said it would require dire circumstances for a non-resident property owner to be allowed in. I do not know if I have dire circumstances without being able to check. Why would the criteria for my access to my property be any different from anyone else's to theirs? Southern Shores must take action to represent all of its taxpayers and constituents during this time because Dare County and Southern Shores have deprived me and my family from the access to use and access use and quiet enjoyment of my property. I demand the town refund town property taxes for the period that my access is denied. This would be fair and reasonable. This would be a fair and reasonable accommodation. Why should I pay for something I'm not allowed to use? The town council should be determining actions that are fair to all its taxpaying citizens, not just those that have a driver's license with a local address. I demand that the council de develop a re resolution supporting the right rights of its non-resident owners and petition Derrick County to allow access to our property. At what point will the denial of access for a certain class of property owner be judged to be unnecessary? When the Dare County COVID-19 infection rate per capita is the same as the national average or some other figure? Is this pandemic likely to continue for a long time until there is a vaccine? I, should, I, should I anticipate that the health and safety of resident property owners will be continue to require that I be barred from my property until then? As the virus spreads every, everywhere, no particular place will be safer than another and unfairly limiting one group of residents, one group of owners, I'm sorry, to their property will not be, will not be effective as workers and delivery drivers and residents come and go. And that's Mr. Garber's report. Thank you. <coughs> Southern Shores Council, this is from Peggy South. My husband and I own a second home on Crooked Back Loop in Southern Shores, North Carolina. Our permanent address is in, Virgi is in Virginia Beach. We bought our OBX house in 2011 with the intent of living here, living there permanently upon my husband's retirement within the next few years. We have never rented our, out our second home. We try to get to the Outer Banks as much as we can, which is mostly during the summer and on school breaks and long weekends. So it's, since we have very active tween, ten, twin teenage daughters, we bought the home after renting vacation homes in this, in, on the Outer Banks for a number of years, as we love it there. Between the renting and the buying, we have contributed many dollars to the OBX economy. All the permanent residents, neighbors, contractors, retail and service industry locals that we have encountered in our time there have always been welcoming, polite and happy to meet us and have our business. It's one of the main reasons we decided to buy property there. Everyone is friendly. Front page article this morning, Virginia Pilot newspaper entitled Tensions Running High in OBX, as well as the vitriol I've seen online from both locals and non-resident property owners is highly disturbing and disappointing. My intent is not to add to the tension, but to try to obtain some clarification as to if and when non-residents non may be allowed back in to maintain their properties. To be determined, never is there a plan I am abiding I'm abiding and staying away from for, for the time being, as I can understand if I live there permanently, I may not, I may not, I may have the same protect, protective opinions that many of the locals are expressing. Fear is a powerful defense mechanism. I get it. No one wants to be exposed to this deadly virus. However, at some point in the near future, we will have to ensure that our property, which we also pay taxes on just like permanent residents is secure. And remember, non-resident property owners also contribute greatly to the OBX economy as tourism is the main driver for the community. Since we, don't, since we don't rent out our home, we don't have a property management company that can, that can flush our toilets, cut our grass, switch our, switch our HVACs over to AC, check our plumbing, check that no one has broken into our vandali or vandalized our house, and check on the general condition of our investment. We don't want to end up with, a mold, with mold, plumbing problems, an overgrown yard, or burglary issues down the road. So is the council ready to employ a company to check on and to do these things we can't? The reason I understand the ban of non-resident property owners was put in place was to, as I understand it, 
was put in place mainly to prevent importing the virus into the community and to protect the hospital, grocery stores, and the necessary service related to industries from being overwhelmed. I think it's likely that anyone who contacts the virus would not be treated at the OBX hospital, but sent to the Tidewater area for treatment. Just a guess. As is the case for much of the county, country, I assume there are no uh, restaurants open for business on the Outer Banks. So no chance for spreading it that way. Other venues where crowds congregate have also been prohibited and shut down, just like much of the rest of the country. Thank you. And that completes the ones I have, Sheila. I didn't see Angela. Let's, let's hold on. <clears throat> Not in my package. I'm sorry. Out of my uh, peripheral vision, line of sight. Is that it? Yes. I got one more. Yeah. <clears throat> this is from Man Schwarzma, uh, Southern Shore 69, Hickory Trail. Former Councilman Fred Newberry has shared me his email public comments for today's meeting, and I would like to say that I endorse his thinking and heartily agree that Southern Shores should have a no-growth budget for fiscal year 2020-2021, or better yet, a reduced budget for the next fiscal year. This is a time to be thinking about freezing town staff salaries and reducing property owners ed below tax to taxes, not increasing them. No doubt you have heard that as of this morning, 10 people tested positive for COVID-19 in Dare County, including one person whose viral transmission has been, has been attributed to community spread. In a case of community spread, if a case of community spread has indeed occurred, then we have an outbreak of the disease in Dare County. We just don't know, how they, don't know the extent of it. Although the North, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services is not projected when COVID-19 cases in North Carolina will reach their peak, it is clear from actions taken by Governor Cooper that NCDHHS does not believe that the peak will occur until late April at the earliest. It is not possible to project yet how diminished Dare counties and, town of, and the town of Southern Shores revenues will be for fiscal year. I would also ask the town council to show empathy, concern, and interest in, in those property owners who would shoulder the majority tax burden, burden to beach nourishment if you decide to approve a project today. You may not think the increase is significant for any oceanfront or oceanside property owners, but you could be—you you would be wrong. Many of us who have, who have property in proposed municipal district, service district one, do not have the wealth that, the wealth that Dare County's assessment of our property would seem to suggest. Others of us are losing significant rental income this year because of the COVID-19 emergency restrictions. Some of us have hefty mortgages to pay. Others are tasked with maintaining our properties with far less income than we anticipated. Everyone's financial circumstances are different. It should be considered in your decision-making just as you should consider known individual property owners interests when you curb that exceptions to the non-conforming loss ordinance. You should not assume the tax increase suggested in the in the financial debt in today's meeting packet is not a hardship on property owners. I can assure you that it is. I also do not understand why the commercial district is exempt from tax increase as part of the fi financing of a proposed beach nourishment project. Merchants in the marketplace would certainly benefit far more from such a project than the owners of an oceanfront flat top that's been a family in a, any family for 60 years or so or more and is only used a few weeks a year. By the family. It is further noteworthy that, unlike, noteworthy that unlike many other towns that have done beach nourishment, the town of Southern Shores is not contributing any monies from its general fund to pay for it, at least not that I saw in the data. That's all I have, Sheila. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I brought you the sign-up sheet. We have one citizen. Got it. Paul, did you wish to speak? Yeah, yeah I guess it was. Give us your name and address, Paul. 
I just I had some other comments I want to make, and maybe I'll make them later. Can you can you first give us your name and address? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank sorry, you, Tom. I should have told you. Paul Borzolino, 16 Seventh Ave, Southern Shores. Uh, at this point, I just wanted to thank um, Tom and the control group for the tough decisions that you all have been making. And I'd ask you to pass that on. I know I sent it by way of an email, but I just wanted to do it publicly because I can only imagine how tough these decisions are. I know we're all being affected by them, but I just wanted to compliment you and the control group publicly. Thank you, Tom. And to the rest of the council, have you, as you have worked probably indirectly through Tom to the council. Tough times, tough decisions. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else on Zoom with public comment, Sheila? Thank you. That wait, time wait, wait, someone just came in. Dash 26 Prairie Place. So if you can find him and unmute him. Ernie, if you can unmute yourself. Um, I'm gotcha. Now I'm, not, now I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. If you speak up louder. Sure. Yes, this is Ernie Dash, and I live at 26 Periwinkle Place. And uh, I would echo also uh, my uh, appreciation to. Uh, the council and to the mayor and everybody for the work that you're doing. I am a second homeowner uh, and uh, I share some of the comments that have been made, but uh, at the same time, I'm hunkered down and, and uh, uh, up here in Williamsburg. The only thing that I would like to see is if there was some way that we could in fact come down and even spend just a day, just 24 hours to check over the property and be sure that everything is in place and uh, uh, I don't know how that would work, but any any consideration that can be made that way would certainly be appreciated. It seems to me like the people are crossing that bridge every day, going up to a northern uh, part of Virginia for jobs in Chesapeake or wherever, and they're returning. So us coming in and out and not staying for a long period of time, I would like to think would not be uh, a hazard. So anyway, I offer that as for your consideration. Appreciate it. And somebody else can use the rest of my three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Garber would like to know if the council plans to address the comments that were made during public comment. And Bill Schreiner, 182 Ocean Boulevard. If you can unmute your mic. Can you hear me? All right, you're up. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to express my disagreement with the comment earlier praising the control group for a tough decision. I think actually what that decision did was so a deep division amongst uh, the different um, members of the tax base in Southern Shores. Um, and I think it was executed very poorly uh, the ban at the bridge uh, was not airtight. And anybody who understands the science knows that if you make a travel ban that is not airtight, you will eventually get the virus into the area that you're trying to protect. And given that workers came and went and that locals came and went, it really was uh, a very, very unfair uh, discriminate, discriminatory action towards out-of-town property owners. Others have articulated all of the different reasons and the rights that we would have to be able to enjoy our property. Um, I always felt that the argument that people made that the uh, health care services on the Outer Banks were not sufficient to handle a large um, uh, impact from the pandemic were very false arguments since I believe most of those people, we certainly know 80% of them would shelter in place, that that would be the appropriate thing that they would be directed to do. And anyone who was severely affected would probably be removed from the island and, and taken care of at a different facility off the island. So I think it was a decision that was driven by fear 
and caused a great deal of um, unhappiness uh, between people who formerly all felt that we were different kinds of participants in a same community. I've been coming down to the Outer Banks since the early 60s. My family has owned a house there since the early 60s, multiple houses. And um, this is the first time I ever felt like I was being treated really as a second class citizen there. Um, my question I'd like to finish up with, uh, given the fact that you do have community spread now happening on the island, there really isn't a justification for keeping non-resident owners out anymore. There is a justification for enforcing rules around masks and space, just like the rest of the entire country does, but there is no longer a legitimate reason to stop people from coming on the island who own property there. So I would like to know, will you end it today? And if not today, what will be the criteria that you will use to end this unfair ban uh, 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 on, on non-resident owners from enjoying and using their property? Mayor, who is it? That's all the comments. That's all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. I couldn't hear that. As I read the, at this time, close public comment. And as I read the agenda, we're ne our next item of business is a uh, under num number number five under new business, and I, I'll now call on Bonnie Swain to address this personal personnel policy change emergency sick leave policy tab eight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On March the 18th of 2020, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, often referred to as the acronym FFCRA. Um, with that, there was an emergency um, FMLA leave and emergency sick leave up to 80 hours um, that was granted for, there's six reasons as to why it could be granted to an employee. Um, the law does not require um, first responders to be covered. I felt, and in um, speaking with our personnel attorney, John Lighty, uh, we were in agreement that um, this is something that we wanted to offer to all of our employees as a whole. Um, so what we did was we put a policy together and um, John um, gave his blessing on it. And that's what you will find behind tab number eight. We were told by the School of Government, which I think I have been on about five webinars in the last seven days about this because it's ever changing, trying to keep up with the changes and our attorneys and that sort of thing. So um, <clears throat> we were told that the town manager had the authority to approve the policy. And then when we had our next scheduled meeting, that the council can go back and approve that policy and Wes approved this policy on March the 30th. So, the, and like I said, it's there at tab number eight. So that's the policy and we just need the council to approve that policy. Thank you, Bonnie. Yes, sir. Council, I would make a motion to adopt, come here, Bella. I would make a motion to adopt retroactively the policies were approved by the interim town manager as they relate to emergency paid sick leave and emergency FMLA leave. Do I have a second? I'll second it. I have a second. Any further discussion? If not, uh, if I'll start with Jim once again, indicate if you, by saying aye, if you approve, agree. Aye. Thank you, Jim. Leo? Aye. Tom says aye. Elizabeth? Aye. Matt? Aye. Thank you. Motion is made and carried to, uh, to adopt retroactively the policies approved by the interim town manager. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you.
You asked a question earlier, Sheila, about whether you heard had a question where the council would answer the comments in public comment. Okay, we don't normally do that, but thank you. But we don't, yeah, as a policy, we don't do that. Under 5B, uh, amendment to council rules of procedure, section eight, electronic participation count in town council meetings. Ben, could you address that for us? Uh, sure, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, tab nine, by the way. Uh, there's a, given the situation with the uh, coronavirus and other emergency declarations and other sorts of things and kind of a new world that uh, we're living in right now, uh, it seemed like it might get to the point where uh, it would, there would be some uh, information from CDC or from the state or something that required uh, safety wise for you not to be in a room together, but that didn't actually fix the problem of the fact that some things have to go on and government has to continue to, to act. And the way that most of the town uh, government is managed is through votes of the town council. So uh, when we saw that coming, we brought up with Wes to try and adopt an electronic meeting policy. Uh, prior to the concept of the emergency that we're currently under, our electronic meetings and electronic meeting participation has had a fair amount of back and forth between different entities about whether or not it's legal for municipalities. Um, primarily because there's a statute in the Open Meetings Act that tends to talk about electronic meetings, but there's a couple statutes in the uh, municipalities uh, uh, chapter that relate to being physically present in the council chambers. So historically, we have always felt that there was a risk in having any electronic participation. School governments tended to agree with that their guidance has always been, if you're going to do it, to have a policy in place that's in writing so that everybody understands what the program is and everybody has a guideline and that the, uh, that looking at the physically present concepts you deal with, uh, you don't count remote participants for, for quorum purposes and you don't count remote participants for voting purposes and then Things like closed sessions, there's issues. Uh, I've heard of an issue where there was a closed session. It, wasn't, it was an executive session of a company, but they were doing everything by phone and they thought everybody had gotten off the phone, but there was somebody who wasn't supposed to stay and they stayed and listened. So uh, we, you know, the, the concept of having remote participants involved in closed sessions was, was uh, more interesting. And even if, it, even if it wasn't where you could technologically keep someone else from being there, if you can't see everything around that person, you don't know who else might be there listening. You don't know who else might be there coercing, coercing them. There are a lot of risks associated with remote participation. So the school of government's uh, perspective on it and our perspective on it is that if you're ever gonna do it, that you need to have a policy in place. So you start with that and we had some policies we had done for others. We started with that. And then we tried to consider the current emergency declaration and the fact that that might put you in a situation where it wasn't just one or two people who were remotely participating. You might have, you might have to build your quorum off of at least one or maybe all of the people being remote, remote participants for safety purposes. So, that's why we developed the rest of the policy to try and address that. Um, it takes into account uh, how to deal with closed sessions and trying to avoid them. And it also, at the end, recommends that council go back and attempt to uh, um, correct or attempt to ratify the actions that it does take uh, when there is an in-person meeting. So to, to clean up and say, we took these actions before and, and to take another vote to, to just ratify the actions that you took during remote meetings to make sure it was clarified. Um, there's also been some recent, uh, I don't think it was a formal opinion, but there was a letter opinion from the uh, attorney general, state's attorney general that seemed to say, hey, it's okay to do it. They didn't really address 
the one part that's related to municipalities other than saying, hey, you should think about that, which means that, yeah, it still exists, but we think it's, this is just something you're going to have to do. So our, our perspective on that is that as long as you're trying to act reasonably and you're not trying to circumvent the Open Meetings Act and you're doing the best that you can given the circumstances that exist based on a safety perspective, the likelihood of a court challenge, you know, a court challenge for that resulting in, a, in an issue is relatively low. But as you'll see in the policy that's presented, it also tries to keep you from avoiding taking action in remote meetings where there's not a quorum physically present in the chamber like there is here today that um, uh, you can't put off. I mean, if you can put it off, put it off as long as you can until you have to deal with it. There are some things, as we all know, there are some things we just have to deal with. And when they come up, you got to deal with them when you need to deal with them. But otherwise, the, the less you do, the more you can put off, um, the, the, more, the less likely you're going to run into issues with it in the future. Um, but there, there is a provision in the statute that if you're going to have an electronic meeting, which we deem a meeting where everybody uh, or less than a quorum is present in the, in the council chamber, um, you have to have something available for the public to see they have to be able to come in here and watch or um, and, and, and I think you've got that today. You've got a quorum. If you didn't have a quorum, if all five of you were meeting remotely, you might still have to have a, a TV or something set up where somebody could see it. And I, I mean, I guess I could envision a situation where it was even so dangerous that staff couldn't come in or that there was a, a true shelter in place or martial law or, or whatever level it gets to. And I think you just have to deal with that when it comes up. And, um, but at this point, the way things are currently working, I think that that's how you would do it is to try and have something here for people to see. And then also take an, you know, the statute doesn't require, but to take reasonable efforts to try and do what you've done here with Zoom and try and make it available to the people who are here today. Um, it's actually worked out pretty well. These uh, large TVs here, we can see all of you pretty well. And we could hear all of you pretty well, and hopefully you can hear me um, and the rest of the participants here. So that's what the electronic meeting policy is about. You know, it's not some new concept for the council as much as it is a new concept to address the, the strange situation that we're dealing with. And you know, my hope is that we can all come back to meeting before too long, um, rather than than become more remote, but I think that uh, where we stand today, more remote might be more likely, um, at least for a short period of time. Thank you, Ben. Anyone have question, a question for Ben or questions for Ben? This only implies if there's an emergency, am I correct? A state of emergency? Absent a state of emergency, you have to have a quorum. The, the policy has two parts. Yeah, that's so there's a state of emergency section, which is number two down. Yeah. And then number one is when there's not a state of emergency, someone can remotely participate, but they can't vote and they can't be counted for quorum purposes. Okay. And you don't have to provide the, the external um, audio and video because the meeting's actually happening. Um, but I just want a little it, clarification on it. But, there, but it's a lot more open and tries to let you do more in the emergency situation because that would be the situation. And, and it's more than just a declared emergency. If, you know, God, it, it includes a real safety issue. If, if there was some sort of other strange safety issue that people couldn't be in the same room, but the town government had to continue to do something, maybe even deal with that safety issue then, then uh, it allows for that as well. And my expectation is that uh, when the General Assembly goes back in session, um, that they're gonna have a number of different problems to solve and to address even retroactively um, because this is a situation that it's not just y'all. I mean, it's businesses um, and other government entities and individuals everyone trying to figure it out as they go. And uh, so that there's going to have to be some legal um, changing at the, at the state and I'm sure federal level, federal level as well. Thank you. 
Matt, you and Elizabeth have you have any questions for for Ben? I don't. Thank you, Matt. I guess the only thing I would ask is, and is, uh, what kind of responsibility does the town have if um, someone were to uh, hack in, for lack of a better word, um, and get information that that they ought not to, or whatever? I mean, what what kind of exposure does the town have? even with this policy in place? Well, it's pretty limited. I mean, the, the only time that there's gonna be any situation that there wouldn't be anything that would already be public. I mean, you're recording the meeting, you're gonna publish the meeting, everything we're talking about is gonna be subject to public records and is gonna be part of this open meeting. So the closed session would be the only issue. And, you know, I think I would recommend that, you know, we don't do that Unless you can, unless we can ensure that the technology limits it to just the people who can be there. Okay, thanks. Who who has to declare um, a state of emergency for these rules to kick in? Does it have to be at the local level, or is it like the governor declares a state of emergency for the state, but doesn't affect us for some reason? I think it would be a state of emergency that applies to you. If the governor's state of emergency applies to you, then it applies to you. If, if there's a local state of emergency, then it would apply to you. If the federal state of emergency applies to you. I, I don't think that it, it's always, you know, in, in this circumstance, the state is statewide, but it's not always statewide. Sometimes it's the outer banks and that's the governor declaring an emergency in a certain area. So I think if it covers your geographic area, then it then it would be covered here. Um, of course, if you didn't, you know, this wouldn't be something that you would not, you know, if you if you felt like you could come and y'all could all meet, despite the declaration, then you could certainly do that. But that would be a situation when you could. I can't believe I'm going to ask this because I've been through more hurricanes out here than I can count or even remember. But do we declare a state of emergency when our, like a hurricane hits us? Normally, normally the county does, and we'll we'll follow suit, or we can actually we can actually have our own rules if we have to under the state of emergency. But we try to follow suit normally. Does okay. that make sense? I would assume we would cancel it during the hurricane, but it's just all that mess that we deal with afterwards. That okay? Yeah, and I, and I think you would continue on your historical way of dealing with those sorts of emergencies is that if you you know, had it, you'd cancel or move a meeting and, and then, you know, if you had a meeting, you would try and get to it or, or move it around. But again, even in that circumstance, if for some reason everybody couldn't get here, but it was a state of emergency, but something needed to happen, there was some decision that needed to be at the council level, not something that the mayor or the manager could address, then uh, this would give you a path to do that. My recommendation would be try to avoid using the, the emergency level provisions of this, if at all possible, but it's there if it's necessary to be used. Any other questions, Council? I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, electronic participation in town council meetings, the changes proposed. I'll second it. Uh, we've got to include in that, I think, uh, to address electronic participation in town council meetings and electronic meetings of, of town council, I believe. I think you're, you're approving this document, is that yes. correct? Yes, that's, that's okay. That's what you're saying, yes. Uh, do I have a second, council? Yeah, I second it. Thank you, Leo. Any, any further discussion? If not, all in favor indicate, I'm sorry, if not, let's start, uh, let's start with Jim again. If you're in favor, say aye. Aye. Leo? Aye. Matt? Aye. Elizabeth? Aye. And I say aye. So the motion is made and carried five to five zero. And one last thing to add, Mr. Mayor. Yes. There are a number of towns and counties and other local governments across the state doing this and coming up with policies and dealing with this. And part of the reason why our policy, you know, you adopted a policy two weeks ago and then this is adjusted is because we've been dealing, we represent multiple local government clients and 
and we've we've refined it as we've gone along. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This time I'll reopen up general public comment. I would say, uh, as we reopen this, that our policy in the past has been when we have meetings with people, people are, he, are here in the, in the room with us, we do not normally respond to those, to those inquiries or questions or comments. Uh, I, I want to maintain that same level of, of policy. Uh, I will assure those who spoke reference to access to the county and the reasons for what's happening and how, why we're doing it this way. I will, those, those, those concerns will be shared at the control group level tomorrow. For those of you who had to have those concerns, I, and I shared them here, I will share them tomorrow with the control group members. Anyone else want to speak? Sheila? I can't figure this out. Can I say something? <laughs> There's Matt. <laughs> we can hear you, Ann. I can hear well, you. may I just I say briefly? I May I you. have a public comment? I lost my connection and my video here. And please give us one second, please. All right. Thank you. Okay, I would just like to tell, oh, I got an echo in my phone. Um, the people who, who gave comments, the non-resident property owners, they might be very interested to know that today, six non-resident property owners in Outer Banks filed a federal lawsuit in um, the Eastern District of um, uh, the North Carolina U.S. Court. So, um, this issue has come to a head, I would say, when you have six property owners filing suit, claiming um, constitutional violations. And I'm glad to hear, Mr. Mayor, that you're gonna bring it up in the control group, because I agree with the people who have spoken. Um, I also have relatives who are non-resident property owners, but they have me here to look after their property, um, as well as property managers. So I just wanted to unite with those people and let them know that um, legal action has been taken. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Borgolino has signed up for a second. Yes, Paul. Yes. <clears throat> Again, I'm Paul Borsellino, 16 7th Ave. Um, although you tabled all the issues in number four, A through F, to the April 21st budget meeting, I just wanted to make a couple of uh, comments uh, so that maybe they could be looked at before that meeting. Um, the material that came out, your tab five, I think was the way you titled it, it was like pages 11 through 30. Um, I'm pretty good with numbers and I found it a little bit hard to follow. So maybe that could be looked at from somebody else look at it and see if it's able to be understood. Um, one of the things that I didn't see in there, maybe I missed it, was there was no calculation of how many houses are in each MSD. And obviously that's what a lot of people want to know. If it's this amount of revenue expected in each MSD, you need to know how many houses are in each one to divide that and figure that out. There was also um, reference to town-wide, and my thinking was if someone was in MSD 1 or 2 or 3, they, their revenue wouldn't be expected again as part of a town-wide assessment. So maybe that could just be clarified in the material. And the other comment related to beach nourishment, and I can't believe I'm going to say this because I was literally on the beach this morning helping Joel Newton repair one of the crossovers because it got washed out in 7th Ave. I mean, it, it became a about three foot <coughs> drop off at the bottom step from the recent weather. But maybe it makes sense for Southern Shores to coordinate with Kill Devil Hills, Kitty Hawk and Duck 
with a plan to maybe delay by one year the beach nourishment, but go ahead and do all the planning, do all the figuring, do all the calculations, have it ready to go, but maybe plan a lot of our push to go fast was to coordinate with them to have the cost savings. Maybe it makes sense to get all the plans figured out, but delay by a year because none of us know what's going to be the financial situation um, come summertime. We don't know whether or when or if there's going to be tourists coming in. If it is opened up again, if we open up, we don't know how many are going to come. Um, I just think it's too unsure of a situation to commit money to until we all know better what the situation is. But I'd hate to see the momentum lost. In other words, go ahead with the planning, figure it out, be ready to go, but maybe that plan be for nourishment one year later. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Anybody else wish for public comment? Thank you. At this time, I'll close public comment. I just have one thing I'd like to say uh, before, we, before I turn it over to the other council members to have their say. Uh, I want to assure our residents and non-resident property owners alike, this council um, and our finance and budget officer are keenly aware of the potential negative impact on future availability of funds for our town. I think we all have to acknowledge the fact that we don't, we don't know. We do know we're going to lose revenue uh, directly and indirectly because this, uh, this uh, terrible impact of this virus. And that's all I have. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have something you'd like to add? Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I just would like for um, uh, to say very briefly, you know, I'm, a lot of uh, very strong feelings on on both sides of the of the closing the access to uh, Dare County, and uh, I hope that you know that our community can can survive the uh, the hard feelings and, and it's they are they're real and you know I get it. Um, uh, I would like to say though that truly and really the only way we're going to get through this is for us all to practice um, our, the, the recommendations provided by the, the public health uh, experts. So please, please don't go out when you, we don't need to and all that stuff, wash your hands, keep your distance, because um, that's truly and really what's, what's gonna get us to the other side of this. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Matt? No comments. Thank you, Matt. Leo? I just want to echo what uh, Elizabeth said. Uh, we're all in this together, uh, and there's some uh, pain. We don't all like it, but we got it. Uh, we didn't ask for it, but we got it. So the control group, I know you're doing, uh, 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 trying to do the best you can for everybody. And uh, I encourage everybody to practice that safe distance of staying your six feet away from each other. And, you all can see we're spread out here. So stay safe. Do you have to raise your voice? Pardon? Do you just have to raise your voice? No, I thought I had it up high enough. <laughs> I'm talking about if you want to stay six feet apart, you got to talk a little louder. Yeah, six feet. <laughs> Jim? Um, I have three things and I'll make all of them real quick. Uh, first of all, we've gotten reports that only uh, about a very, very low percentage of um, Southern or Dare County residents that participated in the census. I think it's about a 22% participation rate. The state average is 42. Um, I just implore everybody to do better. You know, let's do better. Um, second thing is on the budget. I can guarantee I'll be going into that with austerity imprinted on the front of my brain. So I think that's a feeling shared by everybody here on council, but I can only speak for myself. And then finally, again, thanks to the staff. I think this Zoom process has worked better than any other town's attempts at it out here yet. So good job, guys. Thank you, Jim. I would second that as well. Any further business? No, that sir. Anybody knows about? 
If not, uh, council, I'd make a motion, ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Meetings adjourned, thank you. Thank you, Russ, thank you.